started in just we'll get started in just a minute. Um, but in the meantime, um, to have some a couple of housekeeping items. What you're seeing right now is the slide explaining our translation functions. So we will be simultaneously translating into both French and Spanish. Um, you'll notice on the bottom um, right hand side of your Zoom, there's a little globe, a little world and interpretation button there. So here you'll be able to choose your language of preference, whether it's Spanish or French. Um, so please uh, test that out right now and you'll be able to hear um, our translators on the other end. We will have a panelist in Spanish um, for those of you who are English speakers and don't speak Spanish um, and so, or French speakers who don't speak Spanish. So at some point you're also gonna need that function as an English speaker. Um, as you've probably heard, our webinar will be recorded and we'll be posting this um, later on after the event. And so it, feel free to share this with other colleagues and friends who maybe haven't been able to join us. We have the Q&A function as well as the chat function. Um, we'll be using this primarily to communicate towards the end, uh, but please feel free as our, all of our presenters are presenting to start writing those questions and answers or in the chat, we have folks on our end that are monitoring that. So if anything pops up, feel free to um, ask that question and direct it to someone if there's a specific um, panelist that you'd like that answered. And um, we will be sending out um, presentations and recordings afterwards. So we're gonna give it one more minute as people are joining and then we'll get started. So thank you everyone. Wonderful, let's get started. Thank you very much everyone for joining us today. We're very happy to have such a wonderful um, group with us today um, to present our Ender Project uh, lessons learned and accomplishments of the Riches Project, so reducing the incidence of child labor and harmful conditions of work and economic strengthening initiatives. Uh, my name is Amelia Kuklovitz. I will be your host and moderator today, but more importantly, I've had the pleasure to be the project director of this project and the um, regional director for Latin America and Asia at Grameen Foundation. If I can have the next slide, please. So just to give you a little run of show and what we're expecting today, um, in our first hour, we'll be hearing from our uh, panelists some opening remarks to understand the importance of the project. And we'll be presenting the Riches Project itself and the toolkit, which is the uh, main piece that has come out of that. In the second hour, we're very um, happy to be joined by multiple pilot um, partners and stakeholders who will be having a panel discussion to let us know uh, how they've been participating in the project and their reactions to the toolkit. We'll have a Q&A session and a conclusion at the end. As I had mentioned, the Q&A function is active. I can see a lot of great people in the chat starting to use that as well. Um, so feel free as we're moving along to be able to um, add any questions or comments as we go through on the, the agenda. So to get started for our opening remarks, it's my pleasure to introduce Thea Lee, the Deputy Undersecretary for International Affairs at the U.S. Department of Labor. Thank you, Thea. Thank you, Amelia. It, it is a great pleasure for me to be here with all of you today and um, send you all greetings wherever you may be. I am really looking forward to this opportunity for the Riches and the iLab teams to introduce to all of us gathered here today the culmination of over four years of work on groundbreaking tools to help safeguard women and children from exploitative and hazardous 
work. These groundbreaking tools will help us achieve our promise to do no harm in our programming. And they will ensure that when women prosper from new economic ventures, their families and employees will, will prosper as well. Before we get started, I'd like to set the backdrop for why iLab funded this project. In 2016, our researchers and project managers noticed some alarming trends. Despite initiatives to support women economically as a strategy to raise incomes and reduce child labor, in some cases, these efforts led to unintended consequences. Uh, as the demands of a growing business put some women and their children in harm's way. Women sometimes turn to their children for extra hands to support a growing business or the household, pulling kids out of school. Women also unknowingly performed work in unsafe conditions themselves or had their employees or their kids do so. In fact, we know that 72% of harmful child work occurs within families, pr primarily on family farms or in family enterprises. A US Labor Department funded impact evaluation of a national cash transfer project confirmed this finding and other external studies came to the same conclusion. To help mitigate these risks, iLab funded the Riches Project to take a deeper look into the issues of microfinance lending, women's economic empowerment, and child labor. After an extensive analysis of the issues, the project spent over four years developing and piloting dozens of tools to reduce these risks. Which brings us to today and the launch of the Riches Toolkit. I am pleased to say that this toolkit represents a wealth of information featuring 13 guides and 46 tools. This toolkit takes a product, proactive approach to countering the risks of unintended consequences of women's economic empowerment from the start. It supports the goal of reducing the risks of child labor and hazardous working conditions during the startup or expansion of a business. As you will see, these tools are designed for a wide range of actors, financial service providers, NGOs, investors, policymakers, and those that support women's economic empowerment. We know the needs of all these actors are different. The Riches team, along with our iLab staff, worked hard to ensure that each tool was tailored to a specific audience, or in some cases, multiple audiences. The team also did the hard work of educating finance actors about harmful working conditions while testing the tools for sustainability. The toolkit reflects the priority that this administration places on promoting gender equity and on combating exploitative labor and hazards in the workplace. I look forward to hearing more about these tools today and to seeing these tools put to good use in the months and years ahead. With that, I would like to hand things over to Brent Kism, Executive Vice President of the Grameen Foundation. Brent. All right, thanks you very much, Thea. And um, thank you everyone for tuning in today. Uh, as uh, mentioned, I'm Brent Chisholm. I lead the programs team at Grameen. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Grameen, we're an international nonprofit founded to empower the poor, especially women, to create a world without poverty and hunger. And we were founded with the, inspired by the example of Professor Yunus and the Grameen Bank in particular, and have used that as inspiration for our work. I, I want to start with a few thank yous because there was a very large team who brought this all together. And um, you wouldn't, the toolkit, the webinar, there are lots of different people who contributed. So uh, first and foremost, I wanted to thank the Department of Labor, the iLab program, and Sarah and Thea for enabling us to, to do this work and uh, start this journey, because this is really just the start of a journey. I, I expect that there'll be much more um, adventures to come along the way. We couldn't have done this without partners. Um, we did a lot of work with the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative and really thank them for their technical expertise in both child labor and the rule of law. It was a real true partnership and team. There were also more than 41 different partners around the world who helped us test early versions of the tools. And we can't uh, name all of them, obviously, but uh, several of them will be joining us today. Uh, the ILO, CEBI, ASA ProSAR, Lapo Microfinance Bank will all be talking about their experiences today, but they are just a, a small set um, of the overall number of partners that contributed to this work. So thank you to all the partners who we, we couldn't manage to uh, include in the, 
the webinar today. Um, I do also want to thank the, the Grameen Riches team, Amelia and Bobby, both of whom you'll hear from today, um, talking about the work. Also, uh, Jenna and Bev, who have done so much work behind the scenes, and while they don't have a speaking role today, we couldn't have done it without them. So I wanted to set the context for today because uh, child labor and women's economic empowerment we see as being inextricably linked. And we think that you need to take an ecosystem vision to, uh, to address them. So I, I lived in Africa for several years and you see very often people um, like the picture on the right, children uh, herding cows in, in Rwanda and working and that was the image I had of, uh, in my mind of child labor. But one of the things I've grown to appreciate through this project is it's not only about children working in the field, it may also about, be about children being present in areas where work is being done. And that's more symbolized by the picture on the left. So even though the children not be, may not be working, they may be exposed to dangers and risks that uh, affect their, their lives. Uh, even though it's not the, the image that at least I had in mind approaching this work. And so to, to address problems like this, it's not enough to just uh, talk to one party. You really have to approach the whole ecosystem. And that's a combination of women economic empowerment actors, policymakers, the women in the field and the um, workplaces themselves. Um, really, you have to, you can't work with just one. And that's the approach that we've taken with this toolkit. Um, and so part of the reason that you'll see so many tools is because we were trying to really make content available to address all different parts of this angle. So hopefully that, that's a very high level view of the approach that we took. Um, it's, um, uh, we're gonna have some really interesting discussions about it today. So Amelia, back to you to, uh, to take us further into the uh, work and the, what you found. Great, thanks so much, Brent. Um, now I have the pleasure of introducing Benjamin Smith, Senior Officer of Child Labor and it's from the International Labor Organization. Go ahead, Ben. Ben, just wanna double check if you're able to, you may be on mute. Go ahead, we can hear you. Hello. Can you hear me? Hey, Bo, yes, yeah, thank you. Ben, Hello. can you hear can us? I can hear you, yes. Great, thank you, Abel. We're just waiting for Ben Smith to, um, to be able okay. to hear his sound. Thank you. Perfect. We can see you, Ben, but we can't hear you. Perfect. Now we can see you, but we can hear you. <laughs> I can I can see your lips moving. <laughs> Maybe if you want to try without the headphones, if that would help just through the computer speaker. Amelia, just a quick check. Uh, can you see my background and uh, can you see me? Sorry, sorry about oh. that. Go ahead, Ben, we can hear you perfectly now. My apologies for that. Uh, so uh, I'd like to just set the stage by uh, remarking on the global figure of 160 million children in child labor. That's one in 10 children worldwide. 
79 million of whom about half are in hazardous work. So this is an increase of almost eight and a half million from 2016 to 2020. It's the first increase since we started to measure 20 years ago. So it's really uh, a wake up call. And that was before COVID. So without mitigation measures, our projections are that that number will rise by another 8.9 million to 168.9 million by the end of 22 this year. In Africa is where uh, the increase happened. 24% of children in Sub-Saharan Africa are in child labor. Uh, so it's largely a rural problem and the agriculture sector accounts for about 70% of child labor. Dramatic impact on education. So more than a quarter of children aged five to 11 who are in child labor are completely out of school. And over a third of those kids, 12 to 14, are out of school. And of course, this is the age range for compulsory education. So most children in child labor work, as Daly mentioned, uh, within their own family units, set unit, 72%. So this unpaid child labor is driven by household poverty, and we need to tackle that if we're going to reach the sustainable development goal targets. Uh, so that means decent work for parents and universal access to free basic education of good quality. These are the essential steps for eliminating child labor. So how does the ILO approach this? Well, we take uh, an integrated approach and recognizing that uh, fundamental labor rights are mutually supportive and interdependent. So uh, freedom of association and collective bargaining uh, no forced labor, non-discrimination, these are closely linked uh, with child labor. Um, freedom of association has, can be looked at as an enabling right so that uh, workers and small producers can join together, collectively defend their interests and negotiate for the wages and prices that uh, would enable them to send their children to school and meet their, their basic needs. So, Non-discrimination, another fundamental right, also closely connected to child labor elimination and, and you know, obviously at the core of our conversation today. Child labor is concentrated in marginalized groups, migrants, indigenous uh, uh, peoples, ethnic minorities, people with disabilities. And we need a transformative agenda for equality, diversity and inclusion, particularly the effective realization of gender equality. So women play a major role in the rural economy as farmers, wage earners, and entrepreneurs, but they face economic constraints because of gender-based discrimination and social norms, involvement in unpaid work, unequal access to education, healthcare, property, and financial and other services. So promoting and ensuring gender equality and empowering women, particularly in rural areas, not only contributes to inclusive and sustainable economic growth, it is also one of the smartest and most efficient ways and investments that we can make to eliminate child labor. So in conclusion, when women have decision-making power in households, they tend to make the right choices in terms of children's education and well-being. And our research indicates that amongst the most decisive factors to break the intergenerational cycle of child labor is an educated mother. So we can end child labor in a generation if we provide quality education to girls and work for women's economic empowerment that's grounded in a broader agenda of gender equality. So in May, we'll hold the fifth global conference for the elimination of child labor. Decent work for parents and integrated fundamental rights-based approach and economic empowerment are going to be at the heart of the agenda. I would encourage everyone to attend the Fifth Global Conference. Thank you very much. Wonderful.
Well, thank you so much, Thea, uh, Brent, and Ben for those opening remarks. We really appreciate having the, the high level picture and um, some of the, the statistics that really drive the, the issue that we're looking at today, the cross section between child labor and um, working and women's economic empowerment. I now have the pleasure to introduce Sarah Sunderland, who is the Senior International Relations Officer at the US Department of Labor and who has been our partner in crime throughout this entire journey. Um, we work so closely with her and she'll give us um, some background on, on the project and its goals. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Amelia. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, yes, as Amelia just mentioned, I worked, work at the US Department of Labor within the Office of Child Labor Force Labor and Human Trafficking. Uh, way back when, it seems like 20, 2017 was a long time ago now, but we funded this project to develop tools for reducing the risks of child labor and unacceptable conditions of work in women's economic empowerment initiatives. Upon the award, the Grameen Foundation set a four-year goal to integrate the issues of child labor alleviation and acceptable conditions of work into women's economic empowerment initiatives. And you'll see the acronym WE a lot, <laughs> and that's what we're referring to, and we'll define it a little bit later. But most importantly, the project set four, four outcomes, which I think you can see on the screen here. Uh, the first one was to uh, increase understanding of child labor and acceptable conditions of work in the context of WE initiatives. And as uh, Thea mentioned, that's really sort of conducting analysis and research and um, validating those findings. So this is where the project spent uh, conducted spent a year conducting a pre-situational analysis to validate uh, some of our fi initial findings, take a deeper look into the cross-sectional issues of microfinance lending, women's economic empowerment issues, and child labor, for example. Once the analysis and report uh, were finalized, the project spent about three years developing and piloting dozens of tools to mitigate these issues, uh, which falls under the, the following um, three outcomes, which you're gonna hear more about today. So the second um, outcome was to increase availability of tools to integrate child labor awareness and acceptable conditions of work into WE initiatives. The third is increase applicability, adaptability, and adoptability of tools, that's a mouthful, to integrate child labor awareness and acceptable conditions of work into WE, initiati we initiatives. And lastly, and most importantly, while we're all here today, is to increase the awareness and adoption of these tools uh, to integrate child labor awareness and acceptable conditions of work into these WE initiatives. Um, by a broad range of stakeholders, which I think this large audience represents. Uh, so as a culmination of this four years of project, which I've had the pleasure of working with the richest team from inception, um, it's been a long time coming and I'm really excited for the team to present to you everything that they've developed and the hard work and the culmination of that. So thank you very much and enjoy, enjoy today's presentation. And back to you, Amelia. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. We appreciate all of your help throughout the project. Perfect. So now I have the pleasure of introducing um, our presenters uh, who will be uh, letting us know a little bit how we got here. There was a very important research activity that informed the entire um, project. So I'm um, also pleased to um, present, uh, as Brent has mentioned, we worked in extremely close collaboration and teamwork with um, the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative. And um, as you can see here, Chris Camillo, uh, one of our international technical experts, experts and Deepa Ramesh, our other uh, international technical expert, have been uh, crucial and, and key to this project and just a pleasure to work with. Um, in addition, we had local technical experts um, in El Salvador and the Philippines as well um, who have been supporting the project. So uh, just to get started with those introductions and I'll pass it to uh, Deepa who will start uh, making the connection for us. Good evening, everyone. So let's talk about women's entrepreneurship and child protection. So you may wonder, what does the research actually say? During our pre-situational analysis, we looked at harmful work for children and adults and women's entrepreneurship at both a global level as well as country levels in the pilot countries of El Salvador and the Philippines. We also examined the relationship between harmful work and women's enterprises, including what types of tasks children undertake, 
in women's businesses and at what point they become involved. One thing we learned is that there's very little research on the intersection of these two issues, particularly regarding the scale of the problem. We also learned that while there are a number of organizations work with tremendous expertise in each of these areas, most of them have little awareness of or involvement in the other issue. However, they all showed a strong willingness to strengthen their policies and programs in order to support women entrepreneurs and to protect their families. So now let's look at some of the specifics of what the research showed. Let's discuss the intended and unintended consequences of investing in women's enterprises, particularly financial interservice, I'm sorry, financial services interventions, such as the provision of microcredit and micro savings. These lessons not only help us understand the relationship between women's enterprises and harmful work, but they also make the case for why harmful child work and harmful working conditions should matter to women's and economic empowerment, or we, actors. So the bullets on the left represent many of the long-held goals for women's economic empowerment. Some of these include business startup and growth, poverty alleviation, food security, and household resilience. The bullets on the right represent the unintended consequences of supporting women's businesses. Over-indebtedness is the most documented negative consequence of microcredit. Other unintended consequences include increased labor burdens, harmful working conditions, and harmful child work, which we also refer to as child labor. With the continuation of the COVID-19 pandemic, researchers, researchers also caution against promoting microcredit as a recovery strategy, since households will incur further debt while already struggling with the increased burdens of unpaid care work. Research has also shown that there's a connection between supporting women's entrepreneurship and financial inclusion and the unintended consequences of environmental degradation and gender-based violence. The research conducted by The Richest Project has enabled us to understand and share what we've learned about the connections between women's entrepreneurship promotion and increased labor burdens, such as child labor and harmful working conditions. And now I will pass it over to Chris. So what does the evidence show about the link between women's entrepreneurship and harmful child work and harmful working conditions? Women start most businesses during their reproductive years and they often choose entrepreneurship as a flexible way to earn income. They start the type of businesses that allow them to balance caretaking and income generation. And they often keep their children, particularly younger ones with them while they're working, whether the business is based in the home or elsewhere, which exposes their children to unsafe working conditions. Often children, primarily girls, take on caretaking responsibilities to free up their parents to pursue income generation, and this can interfere with their education. Children provide no or low-cost labor for low-skilled positions that businesses need, which increases the profitability of the business. And research shows that women prefer to rely on children's labor rather than hiring adult labor due to trust issues, but they also may involve their children in their business to keep them occupied and away from harm or as a way to prepare them for work in the future. Next slide. So this graph, which is underpinned by research, shows the relationship between harmful child work and business growth. It shows that there is an increased risk of harmful work when, if you look on the left, the business is small, when it's newly established, home-based or agricultural-based. And when the entrepreneur is balancing caretaking with work, when the entrepreneur acquires new assets, particularly capital assets, and when the entrepreneur acquires new debts, and when children are used as household self-insurance, meaning the household sees the child's labor as a means to cover income gaps in times of shock. On the other side of the graph, on the right side, we find that the risk of harmful work decreases when the business is larger, when it's growing, it's more established and based outside the home, the business is more specialized, and when the household has accumulated assets such as savings and physical assets. 
there is a greater variety of available financial instruments to meet different financial needs. Now I'm going to pass it back to Amelia. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Deepa. So now, you know, so much chat about the toolkit. Let's dive into it, see what's in there, um, and a little bit about our process. So first, I'd like to start speaking about the toolkit design. Um, Grameen Foundation is, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, Grameen Foundation is known for its human-centered design process. And so here, what we're really looking at is putting the audience, putting our user at the center. And so in in this case, our audience are women's economic empowerment actors as well as women entrepreneurs. We started out, as Chris and Deepa had mentioned, with a deep pre-situational analysis to really understand the issues, not only in El Salvador and in the Philippines, but also globally. The core of this research is really to identify those needs, meet people where they're at, understand what their levels of understanding and awareness are, and build on top of that. We moved into a design process where we held the design workshop, where mainly we take a look at what are our key insights from these researches? What could we glean from that? And then to answer the question of how might we, how might we solve this problem or the solution around different tools? From there, we went into a design process where we started crafting initial tools based on all of these needs and moved into piloting and testing. We were able to pilot and test um, all of our tools in 12 different countries and 41 partners, which was actually a unintended benefit of the COVID pandemic where we were able to really expand our global reach of the toolkit and test it out in a number of more than planned um, environments and countries. From there, um, we are looking at making sure that the iterations are included, the best practices, the feedback that we received from all of our different partners around the world and taking a second round, taking a second revision and improving all these tools into final drafts um, that we are currently finishing, that we have finished and are um, in the process of translating. So this is kind of our process, what we've gone through uh, since 2017 to, to date to really ensure that all of our tools are based on outcomes, are based on um, needs and really respecting the, the audience that um, they're intended for use. So looking at the audience, um, what, you know, as you can see, we are very much focused on this wide range of women's economic empowerment actors. So this is kind of our umbrella term that is really any organization that is um, uh, developing uh, the, or expanding women's businesses. It could be in livelihoods, such in the agriculture sector or in financial services and organizations and, and um, institutions that support women in their, in, in their efforts to increase the access to economic opportunities so, and very much focused on developing economies. So whether these are financial service providers, policymakers, um, microfinance organizations, savings groups organizations, it's really this, this wide of umbrella of organizations, anyone interested in supporting women um, in their entrepreneurships directly. So as kind of a, you know, a high level, um, you know, I'd like to present really our thinking around um, the toolkit and, and really one of the important lessons learned around how we speak about the toolkit and was being able to test this minimum package. So what you can see here is the phased approach. Um, under phase one, we're setting the foundation and uh, which is really focused on being able to support uh, organizations in having their house in order. So really having that strong, sturdy foundation. Phase two, we're building the structure. And so we start involving additional people. And in phase three, we're engaging participants. And so, you know, here really the lesson learned, um, we were able to test in what we call a minimum package, which is a subset of the tools in Cote d'Ivoire, in Nigeria, and in um, the Philippines to really see what are the basic minimum standards and the best practices that any organization could implement without having too much level of effort, without having too much budget, but really that helps them make sure that they are doing good risk analysis and being able to look at their internal policies and procedures and make sure that they do have enough of a foundation so that they are ultimately um, not doing any harm. If I get the next slide, please. Great. 
as Thea had mentioned, this is our glorious uh, Bridges Toolkit for reactors, um, the total uh, number of tools and, and how they're organized. And so similar here, I'll, I'll just speak um, a little bit on the, the different phases. In phase one, really our goal is to involve management level at an organization, at an institution. And so really being able to uh, start building the buy-in of management level um, awareness as well as understanding. And so here, the subset of tools are really focused on uh, making the case uh, and now analyzing the risks and being able to um, have some minimum safeguards in place through our linkages guide, through our emergency um, and external support contact list. Under phase two, we start really building out into the um, frontline staff. That's what the difference is here, is that we're really working on folks who are on the ground to be able to increase their awareness. If I could have the previous slide, I'm still, I'm still doing the, yeah, the toolkit itself. Great, thank you. <laughs> There we go, perfect. Um, so here we're really focused, you know, the people who have that face-to-face -face interaction with women entrepreneurs themselves, because we see this as a very important conduit of not only information and advice, but also um, someone who is really seeing the situation on the ground. And so we're building their awareness as well as employing uh, different tools to be able to um, get more information from participants as uh, here as well. And then under phase three, this is when we start engaging participants. So this is where we start really involving our women entrepreneurs and being able to provide them with different tools to build um, their awareness and to support their needs. Um, you know, the key lesson learned here around um, harmful child work is um, that it's, it, it is something intentional um, and that we really focused on um, as well, you know, as, as part of the solution to be able to go digital. And so you'll see there's a handful of tools that um, are in paper versions, but also in digital versions. And this was as a result of um, Grumane's expertise, but also really responding to additional needs that came up as a result uh, to COVID. So we were designing tools to fit existing digital ecosystems, which was really critical to integrate the richest toolkit into standards and processes that we see will be able to go and work beyond the riches project and ensure sustainability. If I can have the next slide. Great. Perfect. So under phase one, this is our, our, our what we're referring to as kind of our, our minimum package and really what we encourage every reactor um, to review and implement. Um, we've tested these to make sure that they're applicable, that um, the lift and the level of effort is reasonable as well as kind of any budgetary implications. And so um, here we really want to um, build awareness as I had mentioned uh, with we um, management staff. We're um, asking them to identify risks and identify situations situations that particularly where harmful child work may be more of an issue within their portfolio or within the women that they support. Uh, committing to do no harm principles, which is really important um, to one developing women's economic initiatives. So, you know, as Chris and Deepa had mentioned, not only those intended questions, uh, those intended consequences, but what are the unintended, potentially negative consequences? And so, by having those principles in place, it's really um, important that we do commit to those do no harm principles. And finally, knowing where to go for help and finding resources. Um, by no means do we expect a Women's Economic Empowerment Actor to solve such a complicated issue as is child labor on their own. And so really the importance of knowing what resources are in the community or in the country um, to be able to link women entrepreneurs to these resources and be able to um, find solutions that may be outside of, outside of what they're able to offer. So here we have, as far as specific um, different guides and, and, and trainings, um, the Making the Case presentation, which you are participating in a part of to really uh, build in that buy-in. Uh, we have two risk assessments uh, for um, the, within, within this package. Our social, social performance management guide, which focuses on um, social performance management standards, which are um, very cross-cutting, especially in the microfinance sector, uh, leveraging the work with the social performance task force that uh, provides kind of of a gold standard and a set of indicators to really ensure that um, microfinance and financial service providers are really meeting their, their double bottom line of both their financial as well as their social mission. Understanding harmful work is a presentation to really go through the nuts and bolts of what is harmful work, what is child labor, understanding those specifics so that we're able to identify them better and then find solutions. 
uh, the linkages guide, which here in this phase, we're encouraging folks to have the emergency and external checklist. And then finally, we have a guide specifically for investors. Um, we found that as an important part of our strategy, we call it part of our uh, push strategy, is to work with both investors as well as policymakers to really build the case from their perspective. And so here are tools about um, that investors can take as far as due diligence, as far as understanding their risks specifically in women's economic empowerment investments and um, guiding them with some different tools to be able to monitor their investments. Next slide. So under phase two, you know, what are our goals basically under under the building the structure? Um, here we've got the the we've got a good foundation in phase one, nice sturdy ground, and we're moving into the house and building our our, our house and that structure with frontline staff and um, awareness from different participants. So here really the issue is to understand the issues from a participant perspective. Um, while we've done a lot of research in our pre-situational analysis and incorporated a lot of the that in our tools. We're also encouraging um, we actors to be able to do their own investigation and research, understanding specifically from the women entrepreneurs that they serve, what are their needs and their perspectives. We'd want to train frontline staff on child protection and business safety and health so that they're able to distinguish differences in the, um, in the definitions and what is and what isn't, what does it look like, and be able to be more of an advocate with their um, participants. We're asking organizations to strengthen their internal policies and practices. And so we've seen, you know, whether it's on an HR level, whether it's on a products and services level, there's places for improvement that we're encouraging we actors to employ. And finally, considering new and improved products and services. So as a result of this market research or research or talking to clients and participants, we've noticed that in some cases, it's really important to tweak different products or offer new ones. And so um, we encourage that as well. So here you'll find the entire social performance management guide, which includes um, separate tools on um, uh, safeguarding and gender that also kind of complements the social performance management suite. Also that we're encouraging that all staff go through the understanding harmful um, work. The market research guide provides different tools. Gracias. Perfect. Um, the market research guide here we provide specific um, tools, whether it is a focus group tool or key informant interview tool um, that organizations can use and adapt to be able to conduct their own market research and gather those needs directly from the field. Um, the financial services guide is a wonderful guide that goes product by product, savings, credit, remittances, payments, um, conditional cash transfers, and really talks about the opportunities and the potential risks risks of each one of these products based on the research and also based on what we've learned. And so to kind of give um, a we actor a heads up um, as they're looking at their own products and services. And finally, the design workshop, which is where the, these new products or improved products can kind of come out of. So in a, in a meeting with um, key staff and management, a we actor is able to uh, really go through what they've learned and analyze their own products and services and design something better and new around it. Then finally, under phase three, um, this is where we're having people over. This is finally where we're at a level where we're really uh, able to invite participants and really have done the back work. You know, we we encourage um, this phased approach because we, you know, what we've seen and what we've learned is that going straight to the woman entrepreneur um, can have a lot of missteps. You know, there can be confusions in in, in definitions, confusions in needs and support that is that is required, um, and so really, you know building that internal capacity and building that under internal understanding is really important before we get to participant level um, awareness. And, you know, we, we heard over and over again from women entrepreneurs is that, you know, these are very difficult situations that they're living in. You know, one of the main causes of child labor is poverty. And so really not coming at it from a punitive approach and not coming at it, um, you know, from that high level approach, but rather encouraging and building their awareness to take those next steps in the right direction is what we've seen as a project that's really, really key to be able to um, move the needle in, in these issues. So here under phase three, we're building uh, participants' awareness of risks of doing harm while running their businesses. So as Brent had mentioned, not only when it's directly um, harmful child work, 
uh, children engaged in child labor, but also when children are near and around the, bit the business, as well as women entrepreneurs themselves or employees that they have, really you know, building those, those key issues around risks and safety that they can mitigate. Expanding the participants' connections to external um, and support services. So here we're encouraging win-win linkages um, with different um, external uh, organizations. So whether it's um, government programs, whether it's other um, NGO programs, local support, education programs, as Ben had mentioned, that are so key, you know, really creating a, a linkage between the Women's Economic Empowerment Actor and being able to refer these participants to these additional external um, support services services is really key. And then we're engaging households in decision making for reducing risks and doing harm while running their businesses and protecting their family and measuring and monitoring over the time over monitoring change over time. So here again, you'll see our linkages guide, the full suite of tools. Our business diagnostics guide is in, available in a paper and a digital version. And so here, um, a woman entrepreneur directly can take a look at um, on her own cell phone, what are those specific risks that she has at her business, whether they're um, chemical, physical, psychological, and goes through a simple questionnaire, receives some tips along the way, um, and understands her risks globally to start making those steps in the right, in the right direction. This can be used directly with, uh, as a, as a, for a woman entrepreneur or through a field staff officer. Our inter-household dialogues guide is intended for couples um, to go through four different sessions around specific decision-making around resources and risks and children's education um, to be able to make better decisions together. You know, we say uh, that these are conversations that don't necessarily come up at the dinner table. And so we want to facilitate these conversations because we know there are power dynamics and gender roles um, that are intermixed in the decision-making. And so the guide is intended to, to help those. The risky business curriculum comes in a paper as well as digital version, and so those can be facilitated in small groups or um, a digital version that a woman entrepreneur can also access directly on her phone. Um, if anyone has their cell phone out right now, you can um, scan the QR code um, to, that's presented on your screen. Um, that's our, our digital version of, of the education through seven taps, and you'll be able to see um, what the what the education looks like, the questions around that, as well as um, a video that we have there. And then our monitoring and evaluation guide that has a number of tools to really make sure that there's an iterative process and that we're always gathering information and improving um, as a we actor to be able to monitor this change over time. Great, next slide. Thank you. One of the elements that really we, we really took advantage of is um, the U.S. Department of Labor's Sweat and Toil app. And so this is an, a, an app that I, I highly encourage that everybody um, downloads because it is a um, global tool that allows um, any of anybody, but you know, especially a we actor, to understand the efforts to eliminate child labor, um, find the specific child labor data for your country, understand which good which goods and services are produced with child child labor and forced labor. So when we were talking about that risk analysis, um, review any of the laws and ratifications that have happened, see what the government can do to end child labor and um, browse other projects in other places that um, USDOL is, is supporting as far as combating child labor and forced labor. You'll see this tool specifically is incorporated in a number of the richest tools um, because it is updated annually and just has really great simple information um, that can help you understand understand kind of at a first glance what's going on in your country, what are the risk areas, and um, be able to start relating that to the participants and uh, women entrepreneurs that you serve. So I want to um, make a highlight of that, and that's a very important part of our toolkit. Perfect. And then here you can see uh, the richest project is um, it's got a portal on the Grameen website um, that will also be uh, linked from the U.S. Department of Labor website. So we have both of those um, links available here, just so you can kind of see what it's going to, um, what you'll when you visit the page, what it looks like, and. Um, all of the research, all of the tools um, will be available here, and we'll also be sharing out um, these links later on afterwards in, in the website, after the webinar, um, for everybody to be able to access. 
So you'll see that we're kind of organized in three different sections, the actual toolkit. So all of the uh, tools that I had um, just mentioned and gone over, you'll be able to find those in those phased approach. Um, you know, we, we encourage the phased approach, but we recognize that some organizations may um, be able to maybe in a different position and, and encourage browsing around to see any of the, the different tools as they may be um, useful to you. And um, the, all of the tools are going to be downloadable um, as part of the project. Project. One of the, the great benefits um, of working with the Department of Labor is that all of these tools are going to be open source. Um, so we encourage adaptation. Um, they will be available directly in um, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint so that you can make adjustments, um, make adaptations. Each one of the tools has a section about adapting the tools specifically to give you some tips and tricks about what may be needed. Um, our, our, our toolkit is designed to be global in nature. And so we recognize that some ad adaptations based on countries or based on context or based on organizations are going to be necessary. So we provide um, those, those tips. Uh, under the richest publications, you'll find all of um, the different pieces that we've been uh, learning along the way and documents that have been um, important and um, part of the project. And then in our research, uh, you'll find specific uh, outcomes and outputs that we've had as such as our pre-situational analysis, our pilot um, lessons learned, our minimum package testing lessons learned, those different sorts of documents that can kind of help you support you in your journey as we are building awareness um, and employing these, these tools. And then here's just a quick uh, screenshot of what that's going to look like once you go into the toolkit specifically. So you'll see um, the Val Riches and then under each one of the phases, um, phase one, phase two, and phase three, you'll see the specific tools that um, are assigned to each one of them. Um, also, you know, as the global nature of the toolkit, when you click into each one of these tools, you'll see um, the English version as well as the translated versions and so um, all of our tools um, will be translated into French and Spanish and then a, hands, a handful of tools will be translated into um, Filipino as well depending on, on the type of tool and then we'll also have links to our digital tools here as well whether it's seven taps, whether it's um, the risk assessment um, app, um, you'll be able to find all of those as well as um, the videos on, on YouTube if you want to see them kind of separately that way as well. So that's kind of how the navigation will go. And, and you know, as I had mentioned, we encourage people to um, jump around, download documents, take a look. Um, all of that is all of that is 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 there already. All of our English versions and kind of the construction of, um, of that set is already up and and then by the end of the month, we'll have our translations um, available as well. So we'll send out another reminder when everything is, is uh, fully up and ready for folks to be able to uh, check it out in other languages. Great. And then you'll see, you know, as you click into each one of the tools, basically, um, you know, we wanted to make it very clear who is the primary audience of each one of the tools. So you can understand, you know, is this a tool for management to use? Is this a uh, tool with to use with entrepreneurs? Is this, um, you know, something that I use in a phased approach or do I use tools one phase here and one phase the other? So uh, we provide kind of that background. Um, so you can clearly understand the goal, what you'll come out of when using this tool. Um, along with the objectives that are the specific action items throughout that. And then below that, you'll see um, where the, the different languages and you'll be able to download each one of those. Perfect. Well, enough of listening to me. Um, I, I'm really excited um, and, and Bobby will introduce all of our, our panelists, but um, as, as many people have mentioned, it, uh, it would not be possible to have all these great lessons learned without our partners um, throughout the entire project. So I am pleased to introduce um, Bobby Gray, uh, Grameen's Research Director, who will be leading our panel discussion. Thanks, Bobby. Great, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here and I'll invite um, all of my co-panelists if you wanna go ahead and turn your video on. So now we're going to have a discussion. Like Amelia said, this project really wouldn't have been as successful as it has been without all of the contributions of many organizations that have provided us a lot of advice, a lot of um, guidance on what would make the tools practical. So we hope throughout this whole process that all of this guidance will result in tools that you equally feel like you can um, use and make relevant to your own organization. So 
you'll go to the next slide. I'm going to be joined by several people um, across the globe that will share a little bit about their experience in using the tools. Um, unfortunately, Lucy Luna from Asoprosar um, will be unable to join us because she is ill, but Sandra Galan um, will be um, speaking on her behalf. So we're going to start from um, the Philippines and move back towards the United States in terms of our speakers today. And I'm going to first invite Maros Apostal from CEVI in the Philippines. Um, Maros, can you um, say something just so I can make sure that your um, uh, audio is working? I think actually I lost her. Let me make sure. Okay, well, maybe she'll pop back on. And then if she's unable to log on, I know she's had some difficulty getting on today, then I'll ask um, Deepa to speak on her behalf. But we'll, so why don't we, we'll move to LAFO then. So Abel Obinseri, who is the head of corporate strategy at LAFO Bank in Nigeria, and his organization has really provided us some great um, guidance. And LAFO, um, is not new to child labor because they actually had a project with the ILO about 10 years ago. And so they've also provided us some fantastic um, guidance on how to make the tools relevant for microfinance institutions. And so Abel, can you um, say something so I can just make sure your video and audio is working? Hi, Bobby. Great, hi Abel, great to see you. So yeah, about, as I had mentioned, you know, that you had got, you guys had started working on some child labor work with the ILO about 10 years ago. And so I'd be really curious if you can share a little bit about um, your experience in testing the tools and, and if you can also speak to what you think about the tools makes this relevant for those working within the microfinance space and what um, kind of lessons learned you feel would be important for those working in this space to know? Okay, uh, thank you so uh, much, uh, Bobby, for the opportunity to speak to uh, the experience we have had working uh, on this uh, Rishi's Two Kids. So like you rightly mentioned, uh, we've been here for a long time coming. Uh, we had uh, our first talk over with ILO on the uh, on the decent uh, work deficit. And then uh, fast forward to when you also reached out to us again uh, through Patricia, I guess, from the ILO. We were also very, you know, uh, happy to, to jump on this. So uh, what experience uh, did we actually Recording can say uh, we, we are able to, to share now. The point, first of all, is to say that the, the approach that Grammy took was a bit very structured. At uh, first, uh, you didn't just uh, come knocking, you came with you know, a pre-developed uh, two kits that everyone could relate with. So it wasn't uh, uh, you know, an initiative that was hazy. We could just look at those documents, uh, record that we also started by reviewing the documents when you sent them uh, across to us. And we were also able to make uh, comments, you know, as per areas where, you know, adaptations will be needed, uh, say within our country context, even with uh, reference to the global standards. And, and that for, for us, we felt uh, kind of give us the, the, the perspective on uh, being able to just run with the vision. And, and so coming back to the task uh, specifically, you know, when we uh, looked at what we had before on the ILO one, which was an eye opener at the time, we also felt that uh, awareness creation in this type of uh, issues, issues bordering on uh, child labor is something that there is always uh, no end to it. So we started by uh, having meetings with our management team. Also, we discovered that it, it is not something that LAPO can go, go alone at. Uh, we needed to also reach out to the Nigeria Microfinance Platform, which uh, was a bigger platform, you know, bringing together all uh, practitioners within uh, uh, the country. 
So, uh, and what uh, essentially set that apart for us was that the NLP is not just the microfinance operators alone, you also have regulators within that uh, ecosystem. So, uh, in reviewing all of this, we also uh, were able to bounce it off on the Central Bank of Nigeria. At the time, like you, you recall, we also had meetings, uh, uh, the symposium, uh, the workshop that was held, that even the the director of the other financial institutions, uh, you know, uh, was available, you know, to, to really listen to other uh, perspectives as per how we can also domesticate it within the Nigerian context. So, uh, but speaking to what LAPO has specifically done within the system, we had uh, so far, we have done awareness uh, training for all our management staff. As uh, so at the time we had that training, we had over 20 of them, I guess, uh, uh, you know, attended that training. So for us, we, we've had management buy-in, you know, on the Rishi's two kids. And so where we are at now is to, in fact, incidentally, before this meeting, I had just gotten approval to, you know, convert the entire training material to an LMS uh, uh, compatible format. So in the coming days and weeks, we should be able to convert that and deploy through our LMS uh, uh, you know, platform, which for us is, is, is a big deal because we are currently well spread across the country. And so it is not feasible for us to be having in-class and face-to-face -face, uh, training. So we feel that having been able to do all of those will be very relevant. Uh, some other steps that we have also taken uh, so far, looking at the specificity of uh, the initiative that we recommended in the toolkit is the fact that on a, a pre-loan training, uh, because for those for those clients who are within the group methodology, before before they are ever given loans to, we normally group them uh, and then trade them for a space of one to three weeks. So what we have also done now is to begin to integrate some of these uh, issues into their curriculum, the training curriculum that we normally, uh, you know, uh, we carry out within that period. Because the, 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 the fact is without sufficient awareness, without sufficient awareness, there are so many of these incidences that are just being carried out unknowingly to, to, to these, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, prospect or clients as they, they just they just feel that they are doing their children, you know, good as well, until you begin to tell them that this is different. So we, we think now, and as we have already taken steps that awareness creation needs to be massive and that is what we are doing. So we are taking it from inside out. First of all, we are creating our awareness with, uh, with our, our, our management staff and their frontline staff. And so once this uh, team in-house get to have hands-on you know, awareness and you know, uh, full, full awareness as it were with all of this, they can also pass it out to, to, to the clients. And then uh, furthermore, we have also, uh, decided that there are so many surveys that we carry out on a regular basis. Okay, for example, take the client uh, client satisfaction surveys, for example, you know, another uh, a similar service. We have decided also as part of management directive that we begin to uh, bring in some of the questions bordering on issues like this into it. The idea is to also be able to do a bit of the measurability. Granted, there are three three aspects. Uh, you know, as as I, Amelia where where we're presented, but where we are where we are at now is on the awareness creation, and we we are just going all out to create a full awareness first for for staff and then for clients. Uh, but when we also testing the two kits, we had actually tested all of those uh, uh, structures, you know, uh, with with a cross section of clients. Okay, but we know that just having a handful of clients uh, who you presented all of these uh, issues to will not, be, will not be sufficient. So it's going to be a long walk, uh, but it, we are just starting and it is better to really start fast because uh, the time is not waiting for anyone. The incidences are on the go and so everyone has to do that cash up. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Abel. And that was very interesting. And I'm super excited to hear about um, the approval for you to onboard that onto your learning management system. and. You know, one of the tools that we've been creating in the background that's not quite ready is actually to provide the understanding harmful work on a learning management system that people globally could access. But I think we'll have a chance to learn from you guys from LAPO as to how that's working, you know, with your own organization. So 
congrats and thank you so much for all of your support of this project. You really have been a, a very important partner for helping us learn from your prior experiences um, over the past 10 plus years and ensuring that this toolkit is appropriate for organizations like yours. And so I think now, um, if Ms. Monros is now on, I know I've been watching and seeing that she's had some difficulty getting on, but I wonder, Monros, are you, are you on and can you hear me now? Is she coming in as um, Emily right now? I don't know if I can unmute her. I'm not sure. I'm looking in the participant list to make sure she's not as an attendee. Well, her picture's showing up under Emily. That's why I'm wondering if that's okay. her. <laughs> that's her. She's got a new name. All right. So maybe um, I will go ahead and then just move to. Um, to Edgar then. So we're gonna move from Nigeria to Cote d'Ivoire. So Edgar has also been a, an instrumental actor in the development of the toolkit. Um, he and Patricia Richter from the ILO have really provided a lot of that additional technical expertise um, in addition to our colleagues from ABA Roley who really you know, helped us on the design. But Edgar, you've been working with some microfinance institutions and financial service providers in Cote d'Ivoire, really trying to test out um, all of the tools in phase one. And so I'd love for you to share a little bit about how you see these tools kind of fitting into the ILO's work, as well as any feedback that you've received from the partners that you've been working with in, in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, thank you, Bobby, uh, and uh, good morning, afternoon, everyone. Yes, uh, I'm sitting uh, at a regional office for Africa uh, based in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. And uh, from here, the social finance program uh, of the ILO supports the financial sector to contribute to the decent work agenda, including the realization of fundamental principles and rights at work, like the elimination of child labor. What this means at country level, we do uh, this work by working at uh, three levels. Huh? The first uh, uh, relates to the work, uh, the level of policy and regulation. At this level, uh, we introduce the, the richest toolkits into national strategies and policies to ensure that they will be promoted beyond the life cycle of any project, hence exploring a sustainability strategy. In the case of Cote d'Ivoire, we support the Ministry of Economy and Finance through their financial inclusion agency, APIF Cote d'Ivoire, in the implementation of their national financial inclusion strategy 2019-2024. One of the major objectives of this strategy seeks to promote client protection principles and financial education programs. The richest toolkit uh, can hence support the implementation of the strategy and broadens the scope of client protection, setting the foundations to also protect other family members, including their children. By doing so, the Ministry of Economy and Finance can support the implementation of other national policies like child labor policies and its national action plan and concretely collaborate with Ministry of Labor while promoting responsible finance practices. At the second level, we work on capacity building. Through uh, APIF Cote d'Ivoire, the financial inclusion agency, the tool uh, was introduced to market players from the financial sector, including Ivorian uh, Microfinance Association, APSFD Cote d'Ivoire, and the Banking Association, APBF Cote d'Ivoire. As uh, these actors can promote the toolkit among their members within their capacity building programs. Both associations agreed saying that even if some members would be interested in testing the tools, others may not, as any mandatory regulation is pushing them to report on their social performance, like addressing child labor risks. However, they welcome the initiative as if any regulation will come in the near future, they will be prepared to support their members addressing this risk and promoting sustainable, responsible financial practices with a very concrete tool. Together with the, the Microfinance Association in Cote d'Ivoire, we trained and we tested the toolkits with the biggest MFI, UNACOPEC. 
after testing this minimum package, uh, Unicopec came, came up with an action plan which mostly focuses on building awareness, identifying cases, but uh, not managing them because that's not the role or responsibility. So they will be playing the role of referrals and referring those identified cases to relevant authorities or actors who can manage them properly. They also expressed the high interest as they would like to approach social investors, which will require them to report not only on economic performance, but also on social performance. The ILO team also provided inputs huh, on, on those uh, on the investors guide that can be promoted among uh, investors. Uh, at a third level, uh, we work on testing innovation. Huh? So through the ILO Axel Africa project, we are testing innovative approaches to eliminate child labor in global supply chains in six countries in Africa, covering Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, Uganda, Malawi, and Egypt. One important component of the project is to provide a livelihood support to families with child labor or identified cases or at risk of child labor. A holistic package of services, including financial and non-financial services, was developed to support women in the implementation of their income generating activities. Partner involves we actors like NGOs and financial service providers have been trained to integrate child labor risks within the WE programming, using content, of course, from the richest toolkits. End users, beneficiaries, potential clients will also be trained through digital solutions, delivering some of the key messages presented within the richest toolkits. Market research was also conducted to characterize proposed income generating activities, so child labor risks were identified. Labor burden was a major concern when understanding women labor allocation and seasonal calendars. Together with beneficiaries and we actors, we will explore the most effective solutions to address them, like proposing and offering child care facilities and labor financing products. As, uh, as conclusion and concluding my, my, my part, uh, I would say that working at any of the three levels presented, the tool was a very concrete solution to support the financial sector to contribute to child labor elimination through the implementation of national action plans. Child labor requires an effective integrated policy response to be eliminated at the national level and the financial sector has a very clear role to play. Thanks, Bobby, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Edgar. As you were talking, I was um, thinking about um, the experience that we had had with ABLE and LAPO and how important they felt it was that you know, if they started working on this, that it would be really important that the government and the, you know, the central bank and other actors were involved. And I think it really points to the importance of that kind of ecosystem approach that you were also talking about earlier, that it, it takes every, you know, everyone playing a different part, um, you know, to really address child labor um, effectively. Um, so I think we've had some difficulty getting Ms. Madros on. So I think what we'll do is um, before we move to Sandra is I'll have Deepa um, speak on her behalf. We knew kind of it, it was already going to be super late because she was calling in from the Philippines and she'd already alerted us to the fact um, that she may have difficulty getting in. And so um, for CEVI, they were also one of the partners that we tested um, all of the tools in phase one with and had a very um, interesting experience with them because they're a, you know, technically a child, a microfinance institution that has a child protection uh, mission. So Deepa, speaking on behalf of CVI, I wonder if you can share some of the um, experience that CEVI had given their own background and maybe some of the advice that you feel like they might give to organizations considering, you know, the the concept of integrating child protection into their work. Sure. So I have a few notes from Ms. Maros, but um, Ms. Maros, if you're on, please forgive me if I if I misrepresent anything, but I will um, try to stay true to what your feedback has been and what I observed as um, we worked with you through this um, implementation process. So some of the tools that CEVI used in the Philippines um, were the SPI indicator tools, which are based on SPI-4, 
the risk assessments tools for both um, harmful child work and for harmful working conditions, the business diagnostics tool, uh, both the, the frontline workers version as well as the entrepreneur version. Um, they use this by uh, to evaluate the client's business safety and health, as well as to raise awareness to help their clients upgrade or improve their working conditions in their businesses. Um, and they really maximized the use of technology with these tools um, by using mobile phones and also the Kobo Collect app. They also implemented the education module, which consisted of six videos to help women entrepreneurs improve the safety and health in their businesses for themselves and their children. And here also they capitalized on technology using mobile phones, the YouTube app, as well as TV sets. So overall, they feel like they um, every tool had a different intended audience and a different impact. So the SPM indicators and the risk assessment tools they used internally to help them assess their internal practices and initiatives against child on child labor and clients' working conditions. And the business diagnostics and education modules um, helped them assess their clients and household working conditions as well as um, whether child labor practices were observed in their client's portfolio. They've learned a lot from the tools and they said it's hard to compare them and decide which one um, was more or less useful because it's like comparing apples and oranges. Some positive feedback they got from um, their users, their operations department commented saying, that they can now, as a result of um, using these tools, they now understand the difference between child labor and child work. So they're able to distinguish um, between when child work is safe and legal and when it crosses the line into being harmful or um, jeopardizing a child's education. Um, and they also learned that maximizing technology by using mobile phones and various apps made data gathering a lot easier and a lot faster for them, um, which is especially relevant in the pandemic environment. One thing they suggested on improving because um, these tools were designed um, predominantly pre-pandemic, that with the pandemic, it's really highlighted some of the limitations they face in the field and they'd like to find ways to make some of the video presentations they did with the tools more dynamic and interactive um, for both the facilitators and the participants. Um, some of the, uh, the impacts that they've seen, um, their statement of risk appetite, which includes monitoring the risks faced by the clients and raising awareness in the areas of child labor and unsafe working conditions was revised, and this policy has been approved by their board already. Um, they've also revised their environmental policy to include an exclusionary list, and they will be prevent presenting this to their board for approval. The business diagnostics tool, they will be implementing with new clients every six months, and they feel like it's a very complementary tool to their own indicators for child well-being outcome and they will be continuously implementing the education modules um, using the six videos uh, made available in the TV sets in their various branches. So um, as their clients come in, they can watch the videos and um, be educated on the issues and be entertained at the same time. Um, they said that uh, CEBI is a child-focused organization and they can finally say that they are not just measuring the positive impacts of the loan to their clients' households, but they're also ensuring that there's no harm done to them. Um, in, in our interactions as we were working with them and getting feedback with, from them as they were implementing these tools, they also shared with us that um, child protection has always been part of their social mission, but now they have these tools to help them actually achieve that mission. And the impacts, they already look at the impacts on loans on household children, um, but these give them the tools to actually measure that and give them something concrete to, to gauge their progress by. Um, in terms of other um, MFIs and NGOs in the Philippines, they had commented that in the Philippines, there's a growing trend among MFIs 
to provide cradle to grave services, to provide a more holistic um, portfolio of services to their clients. And she felt like the richest toolkit really provides an opportunity for MFIs to do that. And there's currently not a lot of awareness of adding children into the agenda of MFIs operations and the toolkit really helps MFIs to do that and promotes that. Great, thank you, Deepa. It's it's um, you know between Abel and Mrs. Monros's statements, it's it's heartening um, to see the progress that some organizations have made just even through the piloting of the tools themselves. And for those of us who've been working on this, it's really exciting to see them taking action on their own because that wasn't um, that wasn't the requirement to participate in helping develop the tool. So it's great to see um, you know organizations kind of taking a lot of this forward. Um, so now I'd like to invite Sandra Galan from ASOPROSAR, or the Salvadoran Association for Rural Health, um, to talk a little bit on her actual, she actually pilot tested some of the tools herself with uh, female entrepreneurs. And so we thought it'd be really interesting for you to hear her experience um, testing some of these out with women and their spouses. So one of the tools that I know that she tested was the Risky Business Curriculum as well as some of the business diagnostics. But Sandra, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your experience using the tools, but also what feedback you got from the participants themselves. Hola, buenos dias. Me escuchan? Yes. Sí, bueno. Buenos días a todos y a todas. Mi nombre es Sandra Galán. Soy de El Salvador y trabajo en la Asociación Salvadoreña Pro Salud Rural, conocida como ASAPROSAR. Eh, soy del equipo técnico que trabaja en proyectos con mujeres. ¿verdad? En este momento soy la coordinadora de programas sociales. Eh, ASAPROSAR tiene en su misión como prioridad trabajar con eh, población vulnerable. Dentro de estas identificadas las mujeres, los niños y las niñas. Eh, con, con esta visión a, a Saprosar desde hace muchos años hemos trabajado en las comunidades rurales y urbanos marginales, eh, eh, beneficiando con programas sociales ¿verdad? a diferentes poblaciones como las que acabo de mencionar. Eh, hace, hace un tiempo eh, tuvimos la conexión con, con Riches, el proyecto Riches, ¿verdad? que está eh, implementando. Eh, herramientas eh, de trabajo para que estas zonas de, de trabajo de estas mujeres sean más seguras, tanto para ellas como para los niños y las niñas. En el marco de la implementación de este proyecto, eh, tuvimos la oportunidad, un equipo de ASAPROSAR, de ser capacitados en dos herramientas, en la cual eh, la que pusimos eh, en práctica o piloteamos eh, en El Salvador, fue cómo prevenir el riesgo en las zonas de trabajo y hacer espacios más seguros eh, para las mujeres y los niños y las niñas. En, en este marco, nosotras este, identificamos las comunidades y los sectores donde nosotras íbamos a ejecutar el proyecto, a implementar la herramienta. Este, Atzaprosar cuenta con dos programas institucionales de trabajo con mujeres y con niños. Entonces, este, elegimos un proyecto que se llama Ángeles Descalzos, ¿verdad? que trabaja en las zonas urbanas marginales, y un proyecto que se llama Brotes de Esperanza, que este, trabajamos en la zona rural. Entonces, la experiencia de nosotras fue tanto en la zona urbana marginal como en zonas rurales. Uno de, de los beneficios que tuvimos tener estos dos tipos de población fue comparar el, la, el desarrollo de la herramienta en dos zonas diferentes. En la zona urbano marginal estamos hablando de mujeres que tienen eh, negocios o tienen sus ventas ambulantes en algún momento en, en mercados, mercados y terminales de buses, en las cuales este, estas mujeres andan vendiendo de manera ambulante. Eh, los niños y las niñas también eh, venden con ellas eh, se enfrentan a diferentes riesgos, ¿verdad? Por eso tomamos este tipo de población. Y también eh, la zona rural donde eh, hay niños y niñas que se enfrentan al tema de la agricultura. 
¿verdad? Una zona donde hay mucho trabajo en el tema de la caña de azúcar, ¿verdad? Y más o menos por ahí eh, estaría la población. El perfil de estas mujeres con las que nosotras este, trabajamos eh, son mujeres de, como dije, zonas urbanas marginales, zonas rurales, mujeres en riesgo social y vulnerabilidad, eh, mujeres que son jefas de hogar, ¿verdad? que tienen sus familias desintegradas, que han sufrido violencia en las diferentes manifestaciones, es mujeres que están en riesgo de emigrar, eh, en pobreza extrema y pobreza en diferentes niveles, eh, que su actividad económica es una actividad productiva, eh, que en algunos momentos es la única actividad de ingreso para su familia. Eh, mujeres sobreendeudadas que tienen hasta dos o tres préstamos. Eh, mujeres desplazadas por cambio climático. Bueno, algunos casos que se han dado acá en El Salvador por, por huracanes, ¿verdad? derrumbes, deslizamientos, han tenido que abandonar sus casas y generar eh, nueva, una, un nuevo hogar en otros lugares. Eh, también mujeres en situación de violencia de género, por razones de género. Eh, trabajamos con una población de 60 mujeres como la prueba piloto en cuatro comunidades de El Salvador. Es más o menos como un contexto para que este, puedan eh, imaginarse, ¿verdad?, de quiénes son las mujeres con las que trabajamos. Eh, a Saprosar eh, en la aplicación de esta herramienta, ¿verdad? Tenía como objetivo eh, contribuir a que estas mujeres de zonas rurales y urbanos marginales eh, aplicáramos la herramienta y lograr que ellas identificaran esas zonas, ¿verdad? Eh, de riesgo y que al, al finalizar el pilotaje de la herramienta, estos espacios fueran más seguros y pudieran implementar protocolos de seguridad tanto para ellas como para los niños y las niñas. Eh, ¿Cuáles fueron las estrategias que ASAPROSAR implementó? Reuniones en las comunidades, ¿verdad? sesiones de trabajo con las mujeres, eh, incluso algunas visitas domiciliares también para invitar a las mujeres a las sesiones. Y tomamos también a bien eh, trabajar con población de, que ya teníamos en programas eh, de que ya veníamos ejecutando, que son madres de los niños y las niñas de los programas que ya mencioné. Eh, un poco sobre la metodología de, que se implementó, eh, la herramienta contaba con ocho sesiones. Eh, nosotros hasta procesar la adaptamos a diez sesiones, incluimos dos sesiones más. Una de inicio para eh, generar un clima de confianza con las mujeres, ya que al final estos grupos se convierten en, en, en grupos de confianza, ¿verdad? porque queríamos que estas mujeres, sí es verdad que se conocen, eh, porque son de la misma zona, de la misma comunidad, pero cuando hablamos de temas más específicos, necesitábamos que estas mujeres tuvieran cierta confianza para poder expresar, incluso identificar otros tipos de riesgos en el trabajo, que quizás este, no estaban identificados en la herramienta, pero sí ellas lo logran identificar como un agregado a lo que son los riesgos. Entonces, lo que hicimos fue eh, aplicar la herramienta de entrada y la herramienta de salida y que esa primera jornada también nos sirviera para aplicar un clima de confianza. En este sentido, ¿verdad? también elaboramos material de apoyo, material visual, ya que las mujeres con las que nosotras trabajamos también son mujeres analfabetas que no pueden leer y escribir y se les hace mejor comprender por medio de imágenes y de láminas expresivas, ¿verdad?, entonces también se hizo esas, esas láminas, esas herramientas para poder trabajar con ellas. Y este, pues esa fue como la metodología que Asaprosar utilizó. En cuanto a la, al impacto que esta herramienta tuvo ¿verdad? en la aplicación, fue que eh, al momento de que se hizo consultas con las mujeres, ellas expresaron que este, en cierto momento ellas se sienten más seguras en cuanto a que ¿verdad? el desarrollo de la herramienta permitió que ellas identificaran ¿verdad? que sus, sus hijos en cierto momento se encontraban en riesgo en los lugares donde ellas este, implementaban su negocio. En este sentido, ¿verdad? nos decían que eran temas como de, de la vida cotidiana, ¿verdad? Eran, temas bien, eran temas bien como usuales que casi nadie habla de ellos. Y que esta herramienta nos permitió que esas mujeres reflexionaran 
sobre la importancia que tiene que los niños y las niñas estudien, la importancia de identificar los riesgos a los cuales se enfrentan día a día en el tema del trabajo, ya que ellas, por la situación económica que se enfrentan, no les permite en algún momento estar pendientes de los niños y las niñas, no les permite estar es, acompañándolos ¿verdad? en ciertos sectores eh, en las ventas que ellas hacen. Y tampoco, ¿verdad? Les es imposible que el niño y la niña no colabore. Así lo expresaban ellas, ¿verdad? Porque este, en algún momento este ingreso que el niño y la niña ayuda a generar, a ella les permite económicamente sustentarse en sus, eh, en sus servicios básicos, ¿verdad? De su casa, su vivienda eh, y la alimentación, que es lo más importante. Entonces ellas expresaban eso, que esa herramienta a ella les ha permitido reflexionar e identificar nuevamente sus riesgos. Además de eso, también nos dicen que ellas aprendieron, ellas aprendieron a eh, tener, tener una, una visión del futuro con su vida. Ya que identifica que la educación es importante, entonces... Ellas no quieren que sus hijos eh, se queden solo a vender con ellas, sino que ellas quieren que sus hijos tengan una carrera universitaria, tengan un trabajo mejor que los que ellos hacen. Este, nos decían que, eh, porque hicimos un ejercicio donde comparamos este, el nivel de empleo versus eh, educación. Y entonces, ¿qué, ¿qué es el salario que tiene una persona que va a la universidad? Eh, las prestaciones que el sistema le ofrece con un niño o niña que se queda vendiendo en el mercado, por ejemplo. Entonces, eh, ahí es, esa jornada fue bien productiva donde ellas analizaron, ¿verdad? Esa importancia de la educación. En la siguiente también que se me generó una desororidad entre ellas mismas, al saber que las mujeres también están viviendo ese tipo de situaciones y que si ellas se agrupan o se solidarizan entre ellas mismas, ¿verdad? Pueden enfrentar, ¿verdad? Cada día mejor lo que es este, estos riesgos a los cuales ellas se enfrentan. Incluso nos decían ellas, ahora vamos a cuidarnos unas con otras. Vamos a cuidar a los hijos de la otra persona porque yo voy a ver ¿verdad? con quién se relaciona, los lugares donde se mueven. Entonces decían que estaban creando como una red de protección entre ellas mismas y los, y los hijos. Además de eso, identifican también que el, que el niño y la niña trabaje tiene desventajas. ¿Verdad? Que el trabajo infantil, ¿verdad? Las largas horas o jornadas de trabajo de estos niños afectan al final, están más cansados, ¿verdad? Se levantan temprano, este, no rinden lo mismo en, el, en la escuela. Entonces, ellas decían que iban a, a tratar la manera de que estos niños disminuyeran esas horas de trabajo, ¿verdad? Y que tuvieran más oportunidad para hacer sus tareas, por ejemplo. Además de eso, también nos decían que eh, habían visto la importancia de prepararse para situaciones difíciles. ¿verdad? Estar preparadas con un ahorro, decían que era lo más importante tener ese ahorro para que cuando ellas eh, pudieran o tuvieran eso, esos eventos ¿verdad? de emergencia, pudieran contar con, con un fondo o un dinero que les permitiera en algún momento este, ayudar eh, en el momento difícil. Además de esto, este, ellas también dicen que eh, se sienten eh, tan ansiosas en el sentido que este, están trabajando en equipo con mujeres, están apoyándose unas con otras. Esa ha sido como la experiencia, ¿verdad?, eh, que ellas han expresado en los diferentes talleres y las jornadas que hemos tenido. Eh, algunas lecciones aprendidas que hemos tenido en la aplicación de esta herramienta también, ¿verdad? Una es que eh, se debe de adaptar las jornadas al horario de trabajo de estas mujeres ya que en algunos momentos decían, eh, nosotras no podemos en la mañana, solamente podemos en la tarde, este, y eh, adecuar la, el tiempo también, eh, una, un beneficio que tiene la herramienta que son jornadas cortas, pero a veces la discusión ¿verdad? y eso de, de compartir entre ellas, ¿verdad? se hacían un poquito más largas, pero este, ese es un beneficio que tiene la herramienta. También de eso, este, una lección aprendida es utilizar herramientas visuales para que ellas puedan comprender mejor los temas. 
este, también hacer grupos pequeños de trabajo, ¿verdad? Porque nosotras, los grupos que hicimos fueron 10 a 12 mujeres, las que estuvieron en las sesiones. Eh, también ade adecuar un espacio físico, ¿verdad? Es muy importante que ellas se sientan eh, seguras, tranquilas, ¿verdad? En el lugar donde estamos ejecutando la jornada. Además de eso, también adaptar el lenguaje. Cuando nosotras estamos hablando con ellas, ¿verdad? A veces la herramienta tiene algunas palabras técnicas, pero este, nosotros tenemos que tratar la manera de que ellas puedan comprender mejor esta cierta terminología que tiene la herramienta. Este, también creemos que sería importante eh, crear una herramienta como esta también para los niños y las niñas, ya que este, sí sensibilizamos a la mujer, que es la principal, pero también en algún momento si el niño y la niña no tiene claro un plan de vida, ¿verdad? Un, un deseo de superación, tampoco va a colaborar con su madre para poder tener el objetivo que ella tiene. Entonces, consideramos que sería bien importante tener una herramienta parecida para los niños. Además de eso, este, eh, las mujeres identifican mapas de riesgo. Eh, ellas eh, tal vez mentalmente generaron los, los lugares o los sectores donde hay más peligro, ¿verdad? Y eso les permite a ellas tal vez no transitar por esos lugares o transitar con un poco más de precaución. Además de eso, es, identificaron otro riesgo que voy a mencionar ahorita, que no, es, no están clasificados quizás en los riesgos de la herramienta o los podemos eh, clasificar dentro de ellos. Uno es el acoso y el abuso sexual, ya que en los sectores donde ellas se manejan este, se da mucho, ¿verdad? El, más que todas las niñas. Eh, el acoso de pandillas, en el caso de los niños. Y este, la venta de drogas, que en algún momento, ¿verdad? También utilizan a los niños y las niñas, ¿verdad? Para el tránsito de drogas dentro de los espacios de trabajo. Yo creo que esta herramienta es muy importante. Nosotras como esta PROSAR eh, nos ha servido muchísimo, ¿verdad? Nos sentimos muy agradecidas por darnos la oportunidad de hacer ese pilotaje con, la, con las mujeres. Creemos que dentro de la institución se puede seguir aplicando, ¿verdad? Que no es solo a este momento que que la hemos puesto en práctica, sino que también pensamos incluirla dentro del modelo de trabajo con mujer, ¿verdad? Que sea parte ya de nuestra metodología sí. de trabajo, donde ellas, este, bueno, creemos que puede ser de beneficio para otras mujeres también. Nosotras tenemos una población, más de 3,000 mujeres dentro de los programas. Ahorita solo hicimos una muestra, pero creemos que esa herramienta puede llegar a esas 3,000 mujeres y a muchas más. Así que como parte de esa prosar, también disculpo, ¿verdad? Porque la directora ejecutiva no ha podido estar por motivos de salud, ¿verdad? Pero le doy las gracias por la oportunidad que nos han dado de poder expresar esta experiencia. Muchas gracias. Great. Thank you, Sandra, for those remarks. And I think you mentioned several things that I think, you know, remind us of, you know, what we've learned through this project is that you know, poverty and shocks, income shocks to the household are really the, the biggest risks that women face that can uh, push their children into situations of child labor. And another thing that we've learned from organizations like yours and, and ABLE and CEVI on the phone is this kind of balance we have to make between recognizing that when households are in, situ you know, situations of poverty, they need to rely on their children for income generation. And so we have to kind of balance how do we, um, you know, keep them safe, but also find ways to move them out of, you know, situations of child labor. So I, I wanna turn it over to Amelia really quickly to just leave us with some additional um, stories to kind of bring it back to why, you know, why, why we're doing this work and remind us of the people behind. And Sandra, I think you really set that up with a lot of the description of the feedback that you got from the women and the participants themselves. So Amelia, I'll let you um, close us out with some final um, stories. Great, thanks so much. Um, and before I get into those, I just want to remind everybody of the question and answer function that we have at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So we'll, um, after I share these stories, we're gonna, um, we've been getting some great questions within the chat, but also um, I wanna cue you up if there's any questions, burning questions for any of our panelists, um, the, either from our fireside chat that you just heard from or earlier, uh, we'll be happy to, to take those. Um, so first I wanted to start with a picture on the left. Um, and this 
this is um, a woman that we met um, during our field test in El Salvador when we were developing the risky business curriculum. Um, and so this is our, our training curriculum for women entrepreneurs that before we um, were finalizing drafts, we wanted to, to test out. And this woman provided um, a story of her own experiences with child labor as a child. So here, Martha told us really her heartbreaking story after going through the sessions, you know, she realized that um, what had happened to her as a child was that she was placed into slavery by her parents at seven years old. She was promised an education in the big city and was sent off um, to work and ended up working as a maid and a nanny throughout her childhood without getting paid, unfortunately, and also without getting the education that, that she had, that she wanted. Um, and so, you know, she kind of reflected that even though this is something that, that happened to her, um, she was very, you know, hopeful and kept a smile on her face when she spoke about her children and their future and that she was, you know, learning from what we had chatted about and, and really, really focused and with renewed energy to, to support her children's education and their future. Um, on the right hand side, you can see um, a family from the Philippines. Um, here we were piloting our household dialogues, which are designed um, to have amongst uh, couples, families, decision makers. And we had, uh, we met a family of three um, that you can see here. The husband Marvin shared, um, this session made me aware that most of the household responsibilities are done by my wife. Due to the nature of my work, I leave my house early in the morning after drinking coffee that my wife made. And I come home late at night um, after dark, after a full days of work. All of my free time at home, I spend resting. I realize that I can help her more, especially now that I'm home more, and that me helping my wife is being a good role model for my children too. This is from the Philippines. So just some kind of stories of, you know, I, I wanna bring it back to why we're here. Um, it's the, the entrepreneurs and their families that we are wanting to support. And, you know, these are those small conversations and steps in the right direction that um, I feel ultimately make that, that big dis difference in eliminating child labor. And so um, just to kind of bring it back to, to our why and, and, and the, the great people that we've been um, able to interact with throughout the, the project. So I'll pass it back to Bobby, um, who's gonna help moderate our question and answer session. And Bobby, I see you've gotten some great questions in the chat and I have some as well. So um, I'll let you get started. Great. So I'm gonna um, start the first one that I could see and my colleague Emily is also gonna help make sure that we didn't miss anything. And like Amelia said, you can place your questions either in the Q&A function or many of you have started already in the chat. So the first question that we have is from Rani Deshpande, and her question is, um, I'd love to hear more about some of the design responses that were found to be most useful in terms of mitigating the risk of child labor stemming from WE interventions. Does it come down to arranging affordable childcare or were there other hacks that proved impactful? So I'll open that up to Amelia or Chris or Deepa or anybody else from the team. And I, even for any of the panelists, if you have some of your own um, thoughts to that, I'd invite you to respond as well. So Amelia, maybe do you want to start with maybe your... Sure. your um, yeah, I would say absolutely the, um, you know, a lot of, and, and some of our panelists has man have, man have mentioned it, is really um, the pieces around um, language and how we're how we're speaking about the different tools. And so, um, you know, we, we had initially quite a bit of, of pushback using directly the term child labor. And so you'll notice that um, throughout the tools, it's, it's very common that we're using harmful child work. Um, because a lot of our, our partners are coming from the financial sector, it's, it's a challenging term for them to understanding, to understand as well as a lot of preconceived notions that we felt um, that, part that, that partners were giving us on, on what that was. And so harmful child work seemed to be a term that people could understand and were able to make the link a lot better, especially as a women's economic empowerment actor. So I would say that was definitely kind of one of those big high level um, across the across the board um, design functions that, that we learned from the pilot and making it uh, more adaptable. Um, the other piece that I'll mention is just really the, the, the phased approach and the organization. Um, we had initially started our draft tools under a learn, listen, 
act and measure model um, and had them organized that way. And we found that partners were very easily lost. As you can see, it's, it's a lot of tools, it's a lot of guides and trainings. And so really improving our communication and structuring it around, here's the phase one, here's where to get started, here are the best minimum practices um, that are manageable for a reactor to implement was really a good foot in the door and provided more of a clear pathway um, than the one that we were we were previously using. Um, I'll pass it over to to Chris and Deepa, who are also instrumental in the in the tools, um, and be able to share your experience on that too as well. So um, I was going to say thanks, Amelia. That um, often I think projects on child labor child labor runs a huge gamut. There's a huge range, all the way from um, the less harmful tasks that sort of straddle the line between safe and legal and unsafe and illegal all the way to the worst forms of child labor. And I think more often than not, our projects um, focus on the more extreme versions. But the richest project, because we're working with women entrepreneurs and the children are working in the businesses, um, very often, I, I think more often than not, it's the type of child labor that straddles that line that sometimes it's safe and legal and sometimes it crosses the line into unsafe and not legal. So I think where these hacks come in is getting them to understand, getting the families and the parents to understand through the education module, through the intra-household dialogues, how to better gauge where that line is and how to, to keep them on the safe side, um, to keep them in school and giving them some of the tools that they need so that they don't have to take their kids out of school to, to make up the gaps. I think we also um, came up with various concepts to try to help entrepreneurs uh, think through solutions, think through risks first, but then think through solutions after that, because we got a lot of feedback during the pilot that they needed more help with solutions. So we came up with a five fingers concept where um, entrepreneurs think through risks in terms of physical risks, poisons, emotional risks, harm to growth and development and threats to education. So thinking through those risks. Um, and then as a next step, encouraging them to help people in their business who are either working in their business or near their business to understand those risks. And then thinking through solutions to eliminate the worst of those risks. And by the worst of those risks, we mean the tasks that are dirty, difficult, and dangerous, or the conditions that are dirty, difficult, and dangerous, the three Ds. We really emphasize that in our tools. And so eliminate the three Ds, but then also try to mitigate, reduce other risks. And um, providing supervision in the workplace, supervising workers who are working, or supervising others who are just in the workplace is critical. And so we emphasize that. And of course, making sure that work doesn't interfere with schooling. But in terms of mitigating the risk, we came up with a concept called WISE Solutions. The W stands for um, warning, making sure that anyone who's in the workplace um, is, pro is provided with some, some verbal guidance, warnings through signs um, and other things to, to let them know that risks exist here in this workplace and, and to help prevent through just through warnings and through education and training. And then the I stands for isolating, just trying to create barriers to risks in the workplace, either uh, locking up, up hazardous chemicals or putting up a, a, some sort of physical barrier so that either workers or young children cannot get into uh, high risk areas. Um, using PPE is a way to create a barrier and trying to mitigate risks through that. And then the S would be substituting, uh, substituting lower risk tasks, having children do uh, less risky work, less risky tasks rather than uh, higher risk tasks or um, doing other types of substituting, actually substituting a specific, um, uh, putting an adult in, in a work situation where you would put a child if you know that the work situation is high risk. Um, and then ways that we can just eliminate risks entirely. For example, doing work at a different time of day rather than doing work uh, at night where it may be more risky or asking the child not to do that work at all because it's not age appropriate work for them. So through the wise solutions, through the five fingers, through our choose strategy and the three Ds, 
we just tried to help entrepreneurs, again, think through the risks and think through possible solutions. Great, thank you, Chris. And I think just to add to that, um, those concepts are, were even weaved in through the tools for the management and the frontline staff, kind of recognizing that even for those of us at, at Grameen Foundation, you know, we've reflected a lot that, that this line is sometimes very difficult to identify. Um, so how do we even for ourselves remember how to explain it to others and, and make sure that that's weaved in through the tool. So Edgar, I saw that your hand was raised. Did you want to reply to the question as well? Yes, thanks. Uh, I think, I mean, for me, from the experience we had, uh, it's like, as you were mentioning, how do we draw this line? And uh, the, the, the answer we had to that is that, you know, at the national level, the countries uh, draws the line by applying those international labor standards. Huh? I mean, and I think, I mean, two key components would be on what is the minimum age for a children to be legally employed. It's important to know. And then the second convention and the second also labor standard is also about what is light work, light tasks that can be performed by children who are a bit below the minimum age. So those kind of two components are very also uh, interested to be, I mean, disseminated. Huh? And, and I think they, they need to know that it's not Grameen Foundation, it's not us, it's kind of the government agreeing on how they see and what it can be defined as child labor. So this is one, one, one comment on, on that. Great, Thanks. thank you, Edgar. So there had been another question and maybe I'll answer this one quickly because it has to do with, um, I'd, also, I'd love to know how the toolkit has been evaluated so far in terms of monitoring children's work and the tasks that they um, are doing. So I think, you know, it, as Amelia had described earlier, a lot of this project was just about developing the toolkit and piloting it. And so it, in the big picture, it hasn't been evaluated. And that's something that we're really eager to see happen because, you know, we all believe that having the evidence that the tools that we've created actually have the intended impact will be really important for convincing different actors that it's worthy of making, you know, this investment. But I think one of the experiences we had with CEVI, for example, um, that, um, was probably as much about understanding the risks for the female entrepreneurs is that they, they use the business diagnostic tool, which is basically an evaluation tool to really understand where are the risks in any given woman's business. And one of the things that we learned, at least in the Philippines with CEVI, that the risk that really came out to be most prominent is just the stress that women and their children feel working in the business. So, you know, we looked at where their chemical risks, where their physical risks, et cetera, and really found that stress was the primary risk, at least in that particular context. So that's probably one of the only tools where we actually um, have data from somebody using it, as well as, you know, we have an ME guide um, that's there that is aligned with, you know, a, the use of a lot of the other tools. And, you know, so we, we use those to, kind of assess the, the effectiveness of the piloted tools to make sure that it kind of provided us the feedback that we needed to um, make final adjustments to them before putting them out there. Okay, so let me, um, I know that we have several other questions. So let me uh, scan down here. Um, Emily, I've got several here. So let me make sure if I'm not missing. Let me go up here. Yeah, there's a couple in the Q&A section as well. Okay. So I'll go there because I can find those a little bit more quickly. Um, is there a community that did not open out to you during the one-on-one -on -one visit or focus group discussion with the tools? And Nana, I figure your question must um, have to do with just the openness of communities wanting to talk about child labor. So I don't know if Chris Deepa or Amelia, when we were piloting the tools, um, or even maybe even during the, the pre-situational analysis research, whether um, kind of what the community responses were to um, testing out the tools. And maybe Sandra also, you know, might have, because she implemented those, just the openness of communities to engaging in the tools and the, co and the concept of child labor. Great. 
Um, I, from kind of our, our field research in, um, in the Philippines and in El Salvador, I wouldn't say there were any communities that were, that didn't accept us or, or, to, you know, anywhere we, we were very welcome to have the focus groups and have the conversations. Um, definitely as part of the approach was how we went about it and the language that we went about it, um, you know, is very, um, respectful and meeting people where they are and, you know, taking them on this journey, um, as I had mentioned the, you know, coming off as very punitive or high and mighty uh, would have shut down a lot of conversations and, and the participants themselves said that, you know, to talk about these topics, um, I think that the safe space was was really important. And, and I think Sandra had mentioned that in her remarks as well, um, the importance of, of using language in the safe space, but I'll um, deepen Chris or Sandra, if there's any specific stories you want to share on that, go ahead. I think the resistance I remember getting early on is when we were using the term child labor and some of the MFIs who were not familiar with the concept um, said, you know, our clients are already facing so many burdens and so many obstacles. How can we burden them even more by telling them their children can't help in the business? And so that's when we realized, okay, we need to shift our terminology and the way we talk about this so that um, they can understand that there is a line, you know, that it's not that the children can't help at all, but we need to keep them safe, we need to keep the work legal, and we need to keep them in school. Um, so how do we change the way we talk about this so that it, it doesn't immediately kind of shift the tone? Yeah, and Deepa and Cristobal had a um, question that I think is very similar to, to this one about, you know, how we balance families wanting to feel like they're preparing their children to work, um, as well as kind of this concern of, I need to keep my child busy to keep them from, you know, being susceptible to games. And I, I wonder, you know, between you, those on the phone, um, if you have kind of a reaction to that as well. So I, I think there also it's helping them find that line um, between what's legal and what's safe, um, allowing them to work, you know, a couple hours after school if they're at appropriate ages, doing age appropriate tasks, um, as long as they're getting the adequate rest, um, adequate nutrition, and they're, it's not interfering with their education. Um, El Salvador, I think, is the context where we really saw that um, the threat of the gangs and that often it was safer for the children to be working with their parents than in gangs. Um, but I think Chris can speak to that more. Right, I think in El Salvador, a lot of parents expressed um, the concern that if their children were idle, if they were not occupied, that they might become involved in gangs or that they felt it was important for them to, uh, the children to accompany the parents to work to keep them safe rather than keeping them at home. Um, but uh, just what I would add is that um, it's just important in, in work situations, um, supervision is really critical. And so if, you're, if you want your child to learn a work skill, um, just having that supervision and also training, teaching the child um, how to do something rather than saying, go ahead and do it. But how do you do this step-by-step? -step? Um, and that can help reduce a lot of the risk. Um, yet make that, um, activity developmentally appropriate and also um, help the child learn how um, prepare the child for the future but using using training and using a lot of supervision great thank you abel i see that you have your hand up and then this will probably abel i'll let you respond to this and we'll probably unfortunately have to move um to close out the um the session so abel do you want to add to what um chris was just saying uh, okay, I think for me, it would just be a, a bit of uh, kind of tweaking the question to, to see how did we deal with, you know, uh, a, a bit of those resistances that we, we met, okay, uh, because uh, the truth be told, when we approached uh, some of these communities, uh, the pushback was there because, like Deepa also mentioned, there was the, uh, the conflict between what uh, constitute child work and child labor. Okay, but uh, in the course of, you know, demonstrating to them that we are partners in progress, okay, and haven't known us for a very long time, which was for me uh, a perfect strategy for, for Grammy to have also reached out to 
you know, the we actors as it were. So they've known us for a very long time and they know that we've been part of their success stories. So haven't uh, been able to uh, deal with those initial setback. I mean, there was then that openness. So for me, it will, it will speak to the language uh, that is being used when you are meeting with this team. Uh, it shouldn't be uh, coming to them as though you are, you, you are further going to victimize them as though what, what they are facing, you are not empathizing with them. So we need to bring in that feeling of empathy, knowing that they are also, I mean, we are not blaming the victims. Okay, it, it's just fair to, to make that, uh, you know, clear from the very beginning that we aren't here to blame the victims. Uh, you, you find yourself in this condition uh, because of some social dysfunctionality that you, you might have experienced over, over a period of time. And so immediately we were able to settle all of those. I mean, there was then that uh, openness. So I, I think that is the conversation we need to be pushing to every uh, partner in all of these projects to say, when we approach communities, no matter how laid back, uh, laid back they seem to look like, no matter even what you, you experience on site or you even see them doing, it pays to first of all, you know, empathize with them and then begin to uh, bring them into the conversation as a partner in progress. Yes. Great. Thank you, Abel, so much for those. So good final remarks, I think, um, to close out the Q&A. And I, I realize we didn't get to a lot of these, but we will um, as we respond, you know, send the email out, um, we'll, we'll think if we can see a way to provide some answers um, there or maybe in a future blog that we can send out to you so that we can respond to some of these. So, Amelia, I'll let, turn it over to you to close us out. Great. Thank you so much, Bobby, and thank you to everybody. Um, but just, I am so pleased uh, we had such a wonderful turnout. And thank you for your time and your great questions. Um, thank you again to the U.S. Department of Labor. It literally would have not been possible to have this great experience and lessons learned without you. Um, and just to, to thank our entire Riches team, you've seen a number of our faces, but in, in addition, um, Jenna, Emily, May, um, Bev, and um, Guadalupe, who have been in the background as well, just to thank everybody for a wonderful journey over these um, four years, a little more than four years. Um, we wanted to share uh, you know, additional information. This conversation is, is still ongoing and um, you know, our tools will, will continue to exist as well as you know, some of the pathways through microfinance networks and international networks um, like World Vision and the, and the Social Performance Task Force that um, we'll be continuing this work through them. And so um, feel free to reach out um, through our email or at um, riches at Grameen Foundation. You also find um, um, the toolkit will be linked on our website, on the Department of Labor's website. Um, it'll soon be on the ILO, on the microfinance um, platforms in um, El Salvador and the Philippines, as well as um, the Nigerian microfinance platform are all places that will link back to the toolkit to make it really easy. Um, we'll have a feedback uh, place there as well. So if uh, you're interested in taking a look at the tools and providing any feedback, we're very open to, to that conversation continuing there forward, um, as well as our, our, our Twitter and our Facebook handles as well uh, to continue the conversation. So uh, thanks again to, to everybody. Thank you to all of our partners who uh, presented today, as well as our other partners who really enriched the experience throughout the pilot. Uh, thank you again for, for helping us improve all these tools. So it's been wonderful sharing this morning, afternoon, or evening with you. And thanks for everybody, especially on the late end in the Philippines. We really <laughs> appreciate it. But thank you so much for, for your time and, and sharing this uh, space and experience with us. Have a wonderful day. Thanks everyone, bye. Bye. Well done, everyone.